Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. Thank you all for coming. My name is Pam Sador. Our partner this evening is Radnor Conservancy. I'd like to thank all the members of Radnor Conservancy here tonight. And um, I'm a reference librarian at Radnor Memorial Library. And Main Point Books is my independent bookstore, your independent bookstore here in downtown Wayne, Pennsylvania. So again, thank you all for coming. Very exciting that I can build community this way. I'd like to welcome all my friends at Cabrini University right here in Radnor Township, Pennsylvania. And I would like to congratulate Dr. Carrie Nielsen, author of a brand new book just published by Rutgers University Press. The title of the book is Unleaded, How Changing Our Gasoline Changed Everything. Carrie Nielsen is an associate professor of biology at Cabrini University in Radnor Township, Pennsylvania. The author earned a PhD in geological and environmental sciences from Stanford University and a BS from Brown University. So Carrie, Dr. Carrie, I would like to welcome you to your Radnor Memorial Library, author event, partner, Radnor Conservancy, and please, congratulations on your book. And tell us a little bit about yourself and welcome. Thank you, thank you. It is so exciting to be here. I have dreamed of this day. Um, thank you all for coming out to hear a little bit more about my project and my book. Um, it's good to see some friends from far and wide. So um, an exciting, uh, exciting evening. Um, so I just want to tell you, um, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the process of writing the book. Um, and then I'm going to read a brief excerpt from the book. Um, and then I'm going to open it up to Q&A, and I'm hoping that the sort of bulk of this evening's event will be discussion, and I'll get to hear what you guys think, and you'll get to ask questions. Um, so that's the, the plan for this evening. So the book, oh, I was told I should hold up the book. So this is what it looks like. They did a fantastic job with the cover art. I've had, they, see, they made it look like an old gas can. I've had two different people tell me they thought that their copy arrived damaged. No, it, it, they just, they made it like stuffy so that it looks like an old gas can. Pretty cool, pretty cool graphic design in my opinion. So that's- Carrie, we do, like. we do have the book. It's on order and we're waiting. Things are slow. As we know, the world is different now. So we are waiting for our book, but we can't wait to get our copy at Radnor Library. Coming soon to Radnor Memorial Library. I do know that they already have copies at Main Point Books. So if you come away from tonight, just just anxious to get your hands on a copy, you can swing by Main Point Books um, or order it online. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I ended up writing this book because I first learned about the problem, well, lead, as you probably know, um, has been used by human beings for thousands of years and we use it for tons of different things. Um, and unfortunately it's, uh, very neurotoxic, right? It damages the brain, and especially the brain, the developing brains of small children. And I first learned about the problem of childhood lead exposure when I was an undergraduate in the 90s. I had a work study job in the environmental studies department, um, testing soil and water samples from mostly low income neighborhoods around Providence, Rhode Island uh, for lead. Um, and there was a lot of lead around Providence, Rhode Island, and um, we were testing these samples and uh, giving recommendations for mitigation um, uh, plans. And then I uh, went off to grad school and I was studying tropical forest soil, so I wasn't really working on lead at all. Um, and when I was in grad school in 2000, uh, a researcher named Rick Nevin published a paper showing that if you take the curve that is the rise and then fall in childhood lead exposure due to leaded gasoline um, and then shift it forward in time by 20 years so that all those lead poisoned babies and toddlers can grow up into teenagers and young adults, um, you get a very similar pattern 
in the rise and then fall of violent crime. So in both cases, you have kind of a long steady rise and then an even more dramatic drop off. And you see this exact same um, pattern in some other sort of negative outcomes like unwanted pregnancy and high school dropout rate. And Rick Nevin made the case that these generations of kids that were so seriously lead poisoned by breathing in all this lead from leaded gasoline, um, because we know that lead damages learning and memory and impulse control, went on to be more likely to have these negative outcomes. And knowing what I did about lead and how it affects the brain, I thought, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that one paper really influenced the way that I think about the last half century of American history, right? The idea that changes in rates of lead poisoning had a substantial influence on changes in outcome later on. And so to me, that, that really shifted my thinking and I just sort of went about my business. And then uh, several years ago, six, six years ago, uh, I was chatting with some friends, a well-informed, well-read friends, and we were talking about crime and crime rates. And I said, and of course, lead obviously is an important factor to consider. They had no idea what I was talking about. All these folks who knew so much about our country and about um, social factors that influence these outcomes had never heard of the connection to childhood lead exposure. And so I started talking to more people and recognizing that the importance of the historical lead poisoning of American children was something that a lot of my colleagues and friends just didn't know anything about. And I thought, hmm, I should write a book. So I started doing some research about the history of childhood lead poisoning. And one of the things that I was amazed to discover is just how seriously lead poisoned those of us in Generation X, uh, mostly born in the 60s and 70s, um, actually were. So right now, the standard that we consider to be the reference level of lead uh, when they test lead levels in little kids is five. It's five micrograms per deciliter. So when my two daughters each turned one, they went to the pediatrician's office and had their blood tested. And if that number had come back at five or higher, the pediatrician would have worked with us to try to figure out what the source of the lead exposure was and minimize that source so that my kids would be protected. Back in the late 1970s, when the very first nationally representative study of lead in kids was done, 99.8% of the kids that they looked at had levels of five or above. There were a handful of fours, but that's it. Nobody came in below four. And we now know that even levels of two or three can actually damage brain development. So my generation was all lead poisoned. And a lot of us were lead poisoned really pretty seriously. Um, when my kids went to the pediatrician's office to have their blood tested, if their levels had come back at 20 or higher, that's basically considered an emergency. Um, they would have had to go to the hospital for further testing. Uh, they wouldn't have even been allowed to come back into the house until we figured out what was causing this extreme level of lead poisoning. Um, social services would have gotten involved, right, if they had come back at 20 or higher. When I was a little kid, one out of every four children in America was at 20 or higher. One in four. And that's kids across the country. For black kids, it was 50%. Half of all the black kids in the United States were lead poisoned to a degree that we now consider an emergency. And that was across the country. So I knew that my generation had been exposed to more lead than generations past and generations growing up now. But I, until I started doing the research for this book, I did not realize how severe the problem actually was. Um, th that first uh, nationwide study was done in the late 70s. And the average blood lead level for kids at that time was 15. And by then, uh, leaded gasoline was already being phased out. So it's widely assumed that the average in the early 70s was 20. 
that this emergency level was just the, the norm, the average for kids growing up in the United States. So that was really striking to me. And the other thing that I really didn't know until I started doing the research for this book is how many different kinds of evidence we have about the, the outcomes of all this lead poisoning. So there are lots and lots of studies showing that exposure to lead in childhood has an impact on IQ and attention, especially attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder diagnoses, and also on violent crime. And this is one area where, when I first started talking to people about it, I got pushback. They said, um, sure, Rick Nevin showed that this curve goes up and down and then that curve goes up and down, but we all learned in undergraduate statistics that correlation does not prove causation. And how do you know that lead had anything to do with it? But it turns out that that paper is just one among many, many, many research studies um, of various different types. So that was a nationwide study. We also see that exact same trend of rising and falling um, gasoline lead followed by rising and falling violent crime 20 years later in different countries around the world, um, some of which phased out leaded gasoline much later than we did. Um, you see the pattern in different states. So as leaded gasoline was being phased out due to the vagaries of oil refineries and pipeline sightings, some states phased it out faster than others. And those same states saw their crime rates decline earlier than the ones that took longer to get lead out of their gas. You see it at the neighborhood level. Um, they've done studies in New Orleans and in Chicago showing that the neighborhoods with more lead go on to have higher rates of crime. Um, but we also have other kinds of studies. There are animal studies, right? You feed lead to baby hamsters or cats and they show more aggression as grown-ups. Um, we have uh, case control studies and retrospective studies and prospective studies of individual humans. And so to me, the evidence seems really overwhelming. We know that something as complicated as violent crime has a lot of factors that influence it, right? So nobody's arguing that it's just lead. That would be ridiculous. But the idea that lead is one of the important factors, one of the things that needs to be taken into consideration when we think about who does or does not go on to have a higher chance of committing a violent crime, being exposed to lead as a kid has been shown over and over again in many different kinds of studies to be an important factor. So those are some of the things that I learned um, as I was writing the book. Obviously, I come at it from an environmental science perspective. That's what my background is. Um, but a lot of the interesting stuff that I learned was in the historical research. Um, so the excerpt that I wanna read for you guys tonight um, comes from chapter two. So chapter two is called Where the Lead Came From. And it starts with the, you know, the ancient Romans, they used a lot of lead. And it works its way forward um, through lead paint and lead pipes. And then finally to the invention of leaded gasoline, excuse me, uh, in the 1920s. So the problem that was being addressed here um, is the issue of knocking, which is when the internal combustion engine doesn't work properly because the low octane gasoline basically explodes when it's not supposed to and uh, reduces the efficiency of the engine and can actually destroy the engine over time. So they needed higher octane gasoline and people were doing research on different uh, ways of raising the octane um, ethanol can raise the octane of gasoline. That's just regular alcohol like you have in a vodka martini. Um, but this one research lab run by Thomas Midgley for the General Motors Corporation uh, was looking into other compounds and they discovered this, well, they didn't discover it. It's been discovered previously, but they discovered that this compound called tetraethyl lead, if you add it to the gasoline, um, instantly raises the octane by a lot. So uh, they were able to discover that after a great deal of trial and error. And that's where our story picks up for our reading now. Just like that, General Motors had an anti-knock additive that was cheap, effective, and most importantly, from a corporate perspective, patentable. Adding tetraethyl lead, T-E-L, to gasoline would allow GM to double the compression ratios of its engines, 
allowing them to build the bigger, faster, more powerful cars that they had been hoping for. General Motors and Standard Oil eventually got together and created a company called the Ethel Corporation to sell this new product. In a stroke of marketing genius, they called their new gasoline additive Ethel, carefully leaving out any reference to lead, which was already associated with toxicity in many people's minds. The Ethel Corporation hired DuPont, the DuPont Company to manufacture TEL, and they got to work scaling up production. From the beginning, some of those involved in the development of TEL had concerns about its safety. In 1922, DuPont was run by two brothers, and one brother wrote to the other brother that their new product, TEL, was, quote, very poisonous if absorbed through the skin, resulting in lead poisoning almost immediately. One of Thomas Midgley's co-workers, this is in the lab where TEL was developed, later said that, quote, from the outset, it was appreciated that putting tetraethyl lead into gasoline might possibly introduce a health hazard. The first opinions of the doctors who were consulted were full of such frightening phrases as grave fears, distinct risk, widespread lead poisoning. The source of the possible hazard to health thought of at first was not so much that from the tetraethyl lead itself as that from finely divided lead dust in engine exhaust. In addition, Kettering's lab received letters from numerous public health and toxicology experts expressing their concerns about TEL. Midgley himself suffered from lead poisoning in 1923 and went to recuperate in Florida. The federal government was also hearing from concerned scientists and public health experts. In October 1922, chemistry professor William Mansfield Clark wrote to A.M. Stimson, who was the assistant surgeon general at the Public Health Service, that TEL posed, quote, a serious menace to the public health. Clark correctly pointed out that, quote, on busy thoroughfares, it is highly probable that the lead oxide dust will remain in the lower stratum. After reading Clark's letter, Stimson concluded that, quote, the possibilities of a real health menace do exist in the use of such a fuel, and it is deemed advisable that the public health service be provided with some experimental evidence tending to support this opinion. He requested that the Division of Chemistry and Pharmacology investigate the issue. However, the director of the division declined, claiming that such trials would be too time consuming and suggested that the lead industry itself could provide the needed information about potential health risks. A month later, the Surgeon General wrote to one of the DuPont brothers, inasmuch as it is understood that when employed in gasoline engines, this substance will add a finely divided and non-diffusible form of lead to exhaust gases. And furthermore, since lead poisoning in human beings is of the cumulative type, resulting frequently from daily intake of minute quantities, it seems pertinent to inquire whether there might not be a decided health hazard associated with the extensive use of tetraethyl lead in engines. Already, it was recognized that the lead that comes out of a tailpipe lingers in the environment and will result in ongoing chronic lead exposure over time. It was indeed pertinent to inquire about the decided health hazard this would create. Thomas Midgley wrote back on behalf of DuPont, and while he admitted that, quote, no actual experimental data has been taken, nevertheless, he argued that, quote, the average street will probably be so free from lead that it will be impossible to detect it or its absorption. So skipping ahead just a little bit, um, the Surgeon General called a conference in 1924 in uh, Washington, D.C., and public health experts came on one hand, and uh, oil company and uh, automobile company executives came on the other hand. And Frank Howard of Standard Oil gave a famous speech that I'm going to end with. I'm going to read Frank Howard's speech in its entirety. Um, because I think it's so indicative of the way that some people thought about um, industry and public health back in the 1920s. We cannot quite act on a remote probability. We are engaged in the General Motors Corporation in the manufacture of automobiles and in the Standard Oil Company in the manufacture and refining of oil. On these things, our present industrial civilization is supposed to depend. I might refer to the comment made at the end of the war, that the Allies floated to victory on a sea of oil, which is probably true. Now we have this apparent gift of God of three cubic centimeters of tetraethyl lead 
which will permit that gallon of gasoline to go perhaps 50% further. What is our duty under the circumstances? Should we throw this thing aside? Should we say, no, we will not use it in spite of the efforts of the government and the General Motors Corporation and the Standard Oil Pump Company toward developing this very thing, which is a certain means of saving petroleum? Because some animals die and some do not die in some experiments, shall we give this thing up entirely? Frankly, it is a problem that we do not know how to meet. We cannot justify ourselves in our conscience if we abandon the thing. I think it would be an unheard of blunder if we should abandon a thing of this kind merely because of our fears. So it was really interesting to me to discover um, as I've been working on this project, lots of people have asked me, well, didn't they know back in the 20s that lead was bad for us? Oh yeah, they knew. Um, it was really interesting to read about the arguments that went on between public health experts and these industrialists. And the industrialists won. And leaded gasoline was permitted by the Surgeon General's office to go forward. Basically, no further research was done by the federal government on this issue for the next 50 years. And um, by only a few years later, nearly all, over 90% of the gasoline in the United States was leaded and would continue to be until the 1970s. So it was an interesting historical perspective for me to find out about. Um, the book then goes on to talk about the crusading scientists and activists who worked to get the lead out of the gasoline, and then talks about the ramifications and what happened to those generations who were so lead poisoned, and then finally ties uh, what I see as the lessons to be learned from this experience of leaded gasoline that our country has been through to current issues that we're facing, including climate change. So that's kind of the structure. Um, what I'd like to do now, if anyone has any questions, is open up the floor to uh, questions or comments and really have this be a, an open discussion. Thank, thank you, Carrie. That sounds like a very readable kind of book, which is why a public library and a lot of libraries are interested in stocking this because um, it's it's very real. And, and I was wondering, this is my question, combining history, like you said, you found yourself, sociology, and then the neuroscience, just in that working your research, doing your research, was there something that you had to end up editing out of the book? Ooh, that's a great question. Because talk about fear. <laughs> I mean, you had, had you heard from ExxonMobil? Have you heard from any of those big companies? You know, when I started writing this book, it didn't occur to me that, that I would upset anybody just because, you know, I'm writing my little book and a few people will read it. Um, and then uh, Rutgers University Press, I don't know how much you guys know about um, academic publishing, but they sent it out to another expert in the field to be the peer reviewer. And that's typically done anonymously, but my reviewer, bless his heart, um, agreed to, to waive anonymity and let me know who he was. And he's a very famous um, historian, uh, environmental historian up at Columbia University. And he had some concerns with an earlier version of the book Actually, he felt like I cut these uh, these industrialists in the 20s too much slack. So he and I talked uh, about that. That was really interesting. Because I was like, well, they had economic incentives. And he was like, they knew they were lying. We have internal documents. They were lying right. and they knew it. So that was yeah. really helpful. But what I was going to say about him is uh, one of the things he said during that meeting was, you're going to get calls from people who want you to come and participate in their lawsuits whoa that never even occurred to me but yeah so i'll let you know i mean the book's been out for less than a month at this mm -hmm. point so uh, i haven't received mm -hmm. any calls to be an expert witness in anybody's lawsuit yet but mm -hmm. there are a lot of lawsuits going on right now um, mm -hmm. against paint companies and um you know dealing with the, the issue of childhood lead exposure so uh yeah i may have uh, accidentally set myself up as a, a potential expert witness. We'll see. Or starting a lot of conversations that maybe should be started and that you didn't expect. But that's wonderful about being an author and doing research. Let's hear from somebody. Anyone else, please unmute yourself. 
and comment questions for like Chris Karen. Kaiser has a hand up. Is that the is that the hand up symbol in Zoom? Chris, is that you? Chris, do you want to uh, unmute yourself, please? Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, no, I, I didn't have my hand up, but um, let me ask a question. Um, how long? So this started in the 1920s with the addition of lead to gasoline. Um, but um, we only started testing for lead in the uh, in the 70s. We don't know anything about the um, proportion of lead in, in the bloodstream of people in the 30s, 40s, 50s. That's right. There were some small scale tests done in the 50s and 60s, um, but they were mainly targeted at neighborhoods where they thought lead poisoning was a problem, right? So it's not a representative sample. Um, the one study I found that can really tell us anything, anything useful before the 50s uh, was a study in Cleveland um, where they looked at uh, people who are having teeth removed um, and they were looking at the six-year molars and 12-year molars of adults. And so the teeth were removed in the 90s, but these, because they were different ages of adults, the teeth had grown originally in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, and that study estimated that the average for these neighborhoods in Cleveland um, back in the 30s and 40s was over 30 micrograms per deciliter. Um, now that's just one study and it's just one part of Cleveland. Um, but there is reason to think that um, it, it, th this first study that we have from the late 70s was, was not the worst of it. What other questions do you guys have? Melissa. Where's Melissa? Unmute yourself, Melissa. Where is Melissa? You're muted, your, your microphone. There's Melissa. Hi, microphone. Melissa. All right, I'm gonna try it without the headphones in. There you go. Better? Okay. Yeah. All right. I guess the head. Oh, this pair doesn't have a microphone on it. Okay. We well, can hear you. Test the microphone, so now I can hear you again. Okay. All right. Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, so I just wanted to ask if your book gets into the um, specific people that were involved in removing lead gas. Uh, my uh, Eric interviewed Vladimir Hansel who's a UMass professor with us uh, when I went to UMass. And um, apparently he was one of the chemical engineers involved in it. Was, do you go into the science or th just the uh, um, advocates? I have not heard of Vladimir Hansel. I will have to look him up. Um, I, yeah, I talk about um, two really important scientists. Uh, one of whom was called Claire Patterson. Um, C-L-A-I-R, which I guess is a man's name, I didn't realize. Um, and there was actually a radio lab podcast last week or the week before, all about Claire Patterson. So if you want to hear more about him, um, if you don't listen to radio lab, it's a great podcast. But he was, um, he was actually studying the age of the earth, which you do by looking at the ratio of uh, uranium isotopes to lead isotopes, right? But he kept finding too much lead like more than the rocks should have in them. And he discovered that his equipment was contaminated with lead. And then he discovered that his whole lab was contaminated with lead. Then he discovered that he and his fellow researchers were contaminated with lead. And so he did some really important work on um, discovering that the natural background level of lead is very close to zero, but that at this time he was doing his research in the 60s and 70s the amount of industrial lead that people were exposed to was really, really high. So I do talk a bit about Claire Patterson. And then Herbert Needleman was actually a physician um, who studied kids. Um, this is back when they thought that the only real concern was the level of lead poisoning so high where you have like convulsions, right? And anything under that was safe and fine. And so Needleman started studying kids with what at the time was considered low levels of lead, um, under 25. <laughs> and um, he did a really cool study that also involved teeth. 
So the th lead only hangs around in your blood, has a half-life of about six months. So if you test someone's blood, you know how much lead they've been exposed to over the past year or so, but not really before that. But because it mimics calcium, it sticks around in your teeth for a long time. So Needleman did this cool study where he looked at baby teeth. Um, they went around and collected baby teeth from kids all over Boston. And they actually, this is one of my favorite historical stories. They actually had a special certificate to give to the kids to put under their pillow for the tooth fairy, saying that they had donated their tooth to science and so they would still get their quarter or whatever. Um, but anyway, he was able to show that even below what was considered to be dangerous at the time, the kids with more lead in their teeth were more likely to have their teachers say that they had behavior issues, they had trouble paying attention, um, and they, they struggled with that sort of thing. So he did a lot of important work showing, you know, Claire Patterson did a lot of important work showing there's all this lead around, and Herbert Needleman did a lot of important work showing, and it's harming our kids. Obviously, lots of other scientists have been involved over time, but those are two that I happen to focus on in the book. But I'll have to I'll have to look up the UMass professor. Okay, I was just telling him at dinner that I was coming to this, and he was like, "Oh, I interviewed one of our professors about his his part of the in that removal." So that's awesome. Good for him. I'll send you the name. Thank you. Um. It, oh yes, go ahead. Hi, Carrie. Uh, thank you for explaining why lead was added to gasoline. Can you tell me uh, why there is lead in paint and maybe what other products might have had lead added to it and for what reason? Thank you. Absolutely. So one of the things I talk about in the book is just how amazingly useful lead is. Um, and so one of the things it's really good for is making pigments. And this is why it ended up in paint. Um, there's a, a white pigment that's a, um, an organic form of lead um, that was highly sought after for paint. It's, it's very white and it was very durable, so uh, it lasted a long time. There was actually a time when there was a law, a labeling law, that um, you had to say if you were using something other than white lead because the painters wanted to make sure they were getting the good stuff, the lead paint, and not these, these poor imitations. Um, it's also historically been used in pigments for other purposes. Um, in Roman times, uh, I guess the upper class ladies, it was very fashionable to have really pale skin. And so they used this white makeup that was basically just lead. They <laughs> were just putting lead on their face. Um, and there's a red pigment that has lead in it too that sometimes has shown up in cosmetics um, over time. Pipes, I'm sure you know about. It's a metal that doesn't rust. And so if you're if you're trying to make pipes that are gonna last for a long time, um, that's that's a use that lead's been put to again since since ancient times. Um, I learned about some other sort of more obscure uses of lead as well. Um, I I had this uh, book reading at Main Point Books a couple of weeks ago. And during this, this Q&A conversation, somebody raised their hand and said, what about the tinsel? Somehow in all my research, I had not learned about the tinsel. In mid-century America, tinsel was typically made out of lead. Um, it's flexible, it's silverish, uh, it's inexpensive. So um, there are a lot of sort of more niche uses that lead has been put to, but pigments, pipes, and this tetraethyl lead that was put in gasoline are, are definitely the big three. Mm -hmm. All right, Frank. Hi, Carrie. Uh, I think the parallels to today's fracking and pipelines is really close to, to what you have uncovered. I was wondering, uh, given that, that lead paint was so ubiquitous and gasoline so ubiquitous, do you have any idea what the percentage of the problem came like? the children getting lead poisoning, was that 50% from gas, 50% from paint, or did it fluctuate? So it's a, it's a little bit of a complicated historical question, but here's what I know. The amount of lead used in paint in the United States peaked in the 1920s. So in the 1920s, people were putting paint that was 50% lead by weight on their walls. Like it was just, they were just putting up lead. And then over time, other pigments were developed, titanium oxide came in, and then during World War II, they needed the lead for bullets, and so people started using other kinds of paint. And so the amount of lead paint on the walls in the United States 
has been declining very, very slowly since about the end of the 1920s. Now we know there's still lead paint on many walls. It wasn't actually banned until the 1970s. So that decline is in fact, really, really long, slow process that we're still in the middle of. Gasoline, there, there was no lead in gasoline until the 1920s. Uh, in the 20s and 30s, there just weren't that many cars. So it wasn't a huge issue. And so you had this big jump in sort of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then this crash in the 70s and into the 80s when it was completely phased out. So if you can imagine, see, I normally talk in front of a whiteboard, I would draw this graph. <laughs> if you can imagine uh, a steep bump superimposed on top of a long, slow decline. And lead, as we heard in the reading, is cumulative, right? So a kid who lives in a house with lead paint on the walls and is also breathing lead coming out of tailpipes uh, is getting it from both places. So you can, you can really stack those curves on top of each other. So I would say that before the 1940s and after the 1980s, lead paint has been a much bigger problem. But there was this period in the middle of the century when gasoline was a, a significantly larger contributor to lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. As you might imagine, and this comes back to your fracking point, the lead paint industry and the leaded gasoline industry spent decades pointing the finger at each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so when regulators wanted to get the lead out of gasoline, some of the pushback was, oh no, gasoline's not the problem, it's just paint. Paint is the whole problem. Um, and then the lead paint industry said, nah, -uh, we're not the big problem, gasoline is the big problem. And so uh, in the same way that, you know, uh, different industrial sources will now blame each other for, for health outcomes, uh, we saw that with paint and gasoline. Thank you. The, the one thing that you mentioned, tinsel, I, I uh, didn't realize that, but there's a person called the lead lady. I don't know if you've run into her. She's from like Seattle and she Oregon. has Oregon. She developed this tool or some sort of equipment that will test lead. And as a grandparent, my grandchildren are not allowed to play with Tupperware, old toys. There's a whole scattering of things. So if you run into the lead lady, you'll, you'll know it. Um, there are, so in my, in my research, we use a piece of equipment called an X-ray fluorescent spectrometer. I have to test for lead concentrations, but um, not everybody has one of those. Um, but 3M makes these little test sticks that you can buy online. It's got a liquid in there. You break a little vial and then you smear it on some paint. And if it turns red, there's lead in the paint. Um, and so I have a, a friend with, who had a baby at the time, a, a toddler. I moved into a new apartment. I was like, I'm coming with my lead stick. And luckily we didn't find anything. And so I was like, she's free to crawl around. It's all good. <laughs> oh, like Kathy has her hand up as well. Where's Kathy? Uh, Kathy, please unmute um, yourself. I did. I did. Oh gosh, the light is terrible. I'll, I'll turn off my camera after asking my question. So thanks, Carrie. This is really fascinating. And my question is kind of related to what Marion asked. And it was known in the 20s that lead was harmful to, to humans, but industrialists made the argument that there's not gonna be that much of it, yada, yada, yada. And um, the regulators allowed lead in gas. But as other people have noted, lead became incredibly common in all kinds of household products, paint, it probably cosmetics, as you were saying. Um, who knew about tinsel? I didn't know about tinsel, but it just became so incredibly common. Were there, was it just accepted? Because once it was used in, uh, commercially, nobody could stop it. So how did it go from just in gas to being so, so common in so many other products that we interact with in our day-to-day -day lives? I think that um, it's been common for a long, long time, predating leaded gasoline. Um, there's this famous letter, um, environmentalists love to quote this letter um, that was written by, I, I have to quote from it here. Um, okay, so Benjamin Franklin in uh, 1786, 
uh, wrote a letter uh, to a young friend about the hazards posed by lead. He mentioned a number of sources of lead exposure, distillers making rum and lead equipment, typesetters working with heated lead type, people mm -hmm. drinking rainwater that had run across lead roofs and so on. He also included a list of occupations whose members had been treated for lead poisoning, including plumbers, painters, and glassmakers. His letter discussed both gastrointestinal effects of lead poisoning, the dry bellyache, and nervous disorders affecting the use of the hands, the dangles. The letter ended with a line that environmentalists love to quote because it has proven so true. Quote, the opinion of this mischievous effect from lead is at least above 60 years old. And you will observe with concern how long a useful truth may be known and exist before it is generally received and practiced on. Mm -hmm. So it isn't so much that lead was put in the gas in the 1920s and then everyone said, hey, we can use lead for everything. It's that we were using lead for a lot of stuff for a long time before that. Um, I think that your question about like, why were people willing to have lead in their house um, is, is a complicated question. I think there are a number of factors, one of which is for a long time, the theory was uh, a little bit of it is harmless, only it's only if you have a lot of it is it is it toxic, right? And so as long as your kids aren't eating the tin foil, you'll be fine. Um, I do think also that our general societal risk aversion has changed, right? So there was a time when people were willing to do a lot of things that were riskier than we're willing to do now. And so to what degree these different factors, um, you know, thinking that you needed an acute dose for it to be dangerous and just being willing to accept certain risks in our life, um, a lack of awareness about toxins. I mean, if you look back, you know, people were taking medicine made out of arsenic and, um, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of things. Um, I think all those factors contributed to like, hey, let's just glaze all our dishware with lead glaze and we'll probably be fine. Mm -hmm. And then Carrie, what about the, the love affair with the automobile? I don't, I think people, they just didn't care what fueled it. They wanted that car and everybody, you know, your eyes were on Detroit, your eyes were on industrialization and after the war, getting people to work and frozen food and on and on and on and on until a consciousness. And that's when you see that lead suddenly becomes something that you have to get out, you have to get rid of. And do you think it coincides with that love affair with the automobile? People didn't care if they, you know, if it was orange juice, it was just, you needed something to make that car go. Yeah, I think that there's a real, a real cultural thing that, that you're describing. And, and it's- Is that sociology? People and their <laughs> sociology things? Sociology is not my field, but yeah. Yeah, but a, a, is that, does that fall under people and their consumer? You know, consumption. And I think it wasn't just cars. I think that during this explosion of technology in the 20th century, um, th there was a real sense that industry is making our life better in all these ways. And so we're going to just let the industrialists do whatever they want because look, now I have a car to drive and frozen food in my freezer. Um, it was really interesting to read about this conference, the Surgeon General's Conference in 1925. It was kind of where this disastrous decision got made. And there were public health experts that showed up and said, don't let them do this. This is gonna poison a lot of people. Um, but the public health side, uh, one of the biggest crusading public health experts was a woman. You know, going to this conference in 1924 probably wasn't taken very seriously. Um, Another was an outspoken pacifist, right? And we had just won this war, hey, rah, rah. And so I don't think he was taken very seriously. Um, there were uh, workers' rights folks who, who were concerned about the health effects of the people in the factories making this product. There had already been deaths by this time in factories that were making this product. Um, but those were low-income workers, black workers and immigrant uh, 
Irish workers. And I think there was a tendency for those folks not to be taken very seriously. So here you have these rich industrialists, you know, I imagine them with their bushy mustaches, right? That are like, the country needs this. And mm -hmm. then you have like a racially diverse group of socialists and women mm -hmm. <laughs> saying we shouldn't do this. And I think that the cultural bias really did have an important impact in how this decision got made. Yeah, and you had the vulnerable the people living in public housing in the city that had asbestos, that had leaded paint on the walls. So, and it is now still about protecting the vulnerable. And so there are countries, I'm assuming there are countries that sell leaded gas. Just That is a fantastic question. Just last month, the UN announced that there is no longer legal leaded gasoline available for cars and trucks anywhere in the world. Algeria, I think it was, used up the last of their stockpile, and it is done for cars and trucks. However, even here in the United States, there are small airplanes that use leaded gas. It's still legal for certain kinds of small aircraft. And we know that the kids who live near the airports where those planes fly in and out of have higher blood lead levels than kids living elsewhere. So... There is still leaded fuel, even here in the United States, poisoning kids. It's just airplane fuel. So it's a much smaller amount of fuel. But um, yeah, people are working on that too. And is it Fifty, cheap? You... It, it's cheap, the leaded gas? So or... these small aircraft need really, really high octane. Okay. And the oil companies are claiming that they don't have any alternatives. Part of the problem here is that uh, there are a lot of cars and trucks, so there's a big financial incentive to figure out a way to make that work. There's only the total number of gallons going into these small planes isn't big enough to make anybody's R and D first priority figuring out how to get the lead out of the the airplane gasoline. Christy, did you have a question? You're on mute. There you go. I was curious, once they realized that these generation of people had lead toxicity, if any measures were taken to try to detoxify or remove the lead from their bodies and how that might have been done? That's a really good question. So the issue is that lead harms your brain during brain development in ways that are basically permanent. Um, and so even if later on in life, you're not exposed to lead anymore. The, the damage has been done. Um, so in, in areas where people are still dealing with lead poisoning now, which is still an ongoing problem, um, there's def the, the, obviously the first line of defense is get the kid away from the lead. Um, but then the second um, set of interventions are actually educational interventions, right? The kind of enrichment that helps kids overcome this damage that's been done and still um, you know, have, have better educational outcomes. We know that exposure to lead is especially, excuse me, especially damaging to kids who are in under-resourced school systems and growing up in families without a lot of educational enrichment. So if you can address those problems, you're not actually fixing the lead, but you're helping the kids you know, have better outcomes. In terms of the generations who are poisoned, part of the issue is that the level that we thought was safe and the level that was in the kids kind of both came down together over time, right? So when I was a little kid, um, the standard for where we consider elevated to be went down from 25 to 10, right? And so at that point we thought, well, anybody who's under 10 micrograms per deciliter is fine. We now know that's not true, right? That eight, nine, 10 is not good, but that wasn't addressed at the time because people still thought that was safe. Uh, we have time for, for another question, perhaps two. Anyone else, if you'd like to make a comment? or ask a question? Jan, do you have a question? I do. Um, this, ex 
the uh, the successful um, campaign to get lead out of gasoline. Um, what uh, lessons can I learn from that and apply to other similar campaigns to uh, fracking or climate change or any one of a number of other issues? Yeah, thank you. So this is one of the reasons why I think telling this story is so important, not just because it's an interesting historical story and it says a lot about my generation, um, but also because I think that the, there are lessons we can learn that are important for now. Um, and I have a whole chapter on this, but, but some of the top ones that come to mind are um, when industry says it would be prohibitively expensive to change the way they do things, they may be lying, right? When, they, when, when regulators propose taking the lead out of gasoline, the oil companies said, oh no, it's gonna be so expensive. The price of gas is gonna go through the roof. The economy is gonna tank. It's gonna just be a total disaster. And that, now, now we know, right? We know how it all turned out and we know that that was never true. So when mm -hmm. industries today say, oh, we can't, we can't provide natural gas without uh, using these questionable fracking chemicals or we can't have regulations to address global warming because uh, it'll be prohibitively expensive and tank the economy. We can look back at this historical example and say, mm, maybe not. Right. I also argue in the book that bringing together scientists, activists, and regulators was really important, that just figuring out the science isn't enough, right? The, the scientists figured out that there's all this lead, a lot of it's coming from gasoline, it's harming our children, and there were still oil companies saying, we don't think you should do anything about that until activists raised the alarm and regulators implemented the regulations. Um, I make other arguments about lessons learned, um, the importance of publicly funded research, right? Because for a long time, all the research on lead was done by the lead industry, and you'll never guess what conclusions they came up with. Mm -hmm. um, and the importance of uh, campaign finance reform, right? Because whose voices get heard in the political process is really important in determining whose concerns are taken seriously. So I think that there are a lot of lessons we can learn and um, the, the, the taking that historical perspective can really help us think about current problems. And I will say one more thing and then Frank, I see your hand, I won't forget you. Um, to me, one of the big lessons is don't give up, right? It took decades right. for, I mean, since the 1920s, there were experts saying, this leaded gasoline is harming our children. We need to do something about it. And it took until 1974 mm -hmm. to begin the phase out of leaded gasoline. And that, I mean, if you were a, a lead activist in the 1960s, it must have seemed hopeless and terrible, right? Nobody was taking you seriously. All these kids were being poisoned. And yet, in the end, they didn't give up and they did prevail. And my children are now growing up much less lead poisoned than my generation was. And to a large degree, we owe that to these folks who never gave up. So I don't know that that's a lesson so much as an inspiration to me, like, mm -hmm. hang in there. That's right. <laughs> Frank, what were you gonna say? I was uh, just wondering, are there any current valid uses for lead in industry? And are these things that we have to worry about recycling? Like I, I sort of remember that batteries have lead in them. I'm not sure. I know car batteries did, lead, lead acid was a way of doing it. I don't know if C and D cells do, but uh, what are current valid uses for lead and how does that affect our recycling? Yeah, so the amount of lead in household batteries is now very, very low. So it's, it was a, a bigger concern, um, but, but now that it's mostly been replaced with other compounds. Uh, but there are, there is a lot of lead in old landfills, right? Mm -hmm. So back when a lot more household uh, items had lead in them and got thrown away. And so one of the things we need to make sure we're doing is uh, carefully monitoring the leachate and anything that's coming out of these landfills that have been around for a while, because, um, you know, that, that could be a source of contamination. There are definitely industrial uses of lead. Um, metallic lead, the kind in pipes, um, it, it doesn't have any airborne 
like if you breathe near lead pipes, that's not dangerous. Um, and it doesn't, the, the metallic lead actually doesn't get into your skin very easily. So if you touch lead pipes, that's not especially dangerous. And so as long as um, industry is using good um, sort of chemical hygiene procedures, um, the remaining industrial uses of lead should be um, relatively safe. There is still a problem of potential contamination in food processing equipment. And we see this showing up. You might have seen um, coverage of stories about finding lead in baby food. This was a, a couple of years ago. There were headlines about this. And some of that is probably coming from old food processing equipment that has lead parts or even lead solder. So they used to like stick the metal pieces together with lead solder. So even if you've got steel on one side and steel on the other side, if you have a seam with lead in it, that could be leaching into the food. Um, but there's also still lead pesticides out there. So back before the invention of organic pesticides in the middle of the 20th century, lead arsenate, which is as bad as it sounds, um, was a commonly used pesticide. And because lead is an element, it doesn't break down. And so it's all still out there. Um, and so apples, for example, that are grown in very old apple orchards that had these lead pesticides sprayed on them, you know, 50 years ago, can still have lead hanging around. And I think we have time for one more. Anyone else before we say good night? Dana, Anything? did you have a question? Oh, she's got to unmute. You can. Dana. Hi, Dana. Unmute yourself, please. There it is. Okay. There you go. Hi there. Well, oh, didn't we have lead pencils? That's a fantastic question. No. The oh, they were lead? lead in lead Graphite. pencils is actually a compound that's referred to as black lead, but it doesn't have any lead in it at all. It's a, it's a carbon compound. Um, okay. And so. Of all the things that I discovered had or have lead, it turns out pencils are and have always been perfectly safe. Oh, because I used to chew on those, you know, <laughs> like, whoa. Why did we call it a lead pencil? And <laughs> is it graphite or no? Yeah, it's so graphite was originally discovered. For some reason, they referred to it as black lead. Okay. Well, well, the thing that's kind of a similar stick. color. I don't know historically why it was called that, but that's right. what's in and has always been in pencils. Well, but the thing that's really sticking with me is is the guy saying that how can we turn our backs on God's gift? Whoa. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. So I, you know, I try to avoid hyperbole in the book. It's easy to paint these industrialists as like evil bad guys, but that guy actually did go on to illegally collaborate with the Nazis during World War II. Wow. So the guy who made that big speech was a Nazi. Wow. What about water pipes? Yeah, that's a great question. So water pipes are still a major source of concern and water pipes are especially complicated because the amount of lead that you're exposed to, if you have lead pipes, depends not just on the pipe, but also on the water, right? Hmm. So when Flint, Michigan had Flint, its water Michigan. crisis a number of years ago, it wasn't because they changed the pipes. They'd had those lead pipes all along. It was because they stopped doing a good job of treating the water. And um, if the pH is too low and if certain kinds of corrosive chemicals are in the water, then the water leaches the lead out of the pipe. As long as the water is very carefully monitored and proper corrosion control practices are put into place, you can have a pretty low level of lead even when the water's traveling through lead pipes. The problem is that, that every lead pipe is then a ticking time bomb, right? Something goes mm -hmm. wrong down at the water plant and the pH shifts slightly. And now every, all the kids all over town are drinking water with lead. So I personally think the fact that the current infrastructure proposal in Washington, D.C. has a lot of money for replacing lead pipes is would be fantastic. I hope they figure out how to pass that because we got to we got to replace these lead pipes. 
but it's expensive and we don't even know where all of them are. It's weird to think about, but like we literally, there are neighborhoods in Philadelphia where nobody knows what kind of pipes they have, but they were put in so long ago, there's our record. Right. Mm. Thank, thank you. That's all we yeah. have time for tonight. But Dr. Carrie Nielsen, thank you so much. And thank you for writing this book. And I'm grateful to Rutgers University Press for um, publishing this book. It sounds like, well, I know we have our copy and it sounds readable. This is, this is a narrative. It's a conversation that uh, people should be able to pick up at their local library. And if you'd like to purchase a copy, you can go to Main Point Books in downtown Wayne. Kathy has books. Um, as Carrie said, she launched her book there at Main Point Books in downtown Wayne. And thank you to Cabrini <laughs> University and everyone here tonight. Thank you for joining the conversation. And this was just a wonderful way for us to build community. We have a public library in, in downtown Wayne. We're open seven days a week. So I hope you'll come see us at Radnor Memorial Library. And thank you to my partner, Radnor Conservancy. So let's say good night and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Carey. Good luck with your new book. I think it's just wonderful. Thank you so first. much. This has been such a treat and thank you all for coming out. It was great to see friendly faces. Thank, thank you. you. See you downtown. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming. Mm -hmm.